Hi. Uh, a pretty big crowd for an art talk, so I'm already happy. Uh, this is Games of Life, uh, talk about generative art in Python. Uh, my name is Wukash. I come from the internet, no, actually from Poznan. It's not very far. I literally drove here. Uh, I work as a CPython developer in residence, meaning I literally work on Python uh, as a my day job. So uh, thanks for the PSF of, for making that happen, and thanks to Meta for actually sponsoring me. Uh, yeah, we're actually having an open position right now called the Deputy Developer in Residence, so if you want to hear more about this, just look at our job listings, uh, it's, uh, or just talk to me at the rest of the conference, like we're trying to hire another person to do what I am doing, so uh, please come and apply. So I usually do like two kinds of talks, right? Like the, the most popular talks that you know I give are usually the, the kind of deeply technical ones where there's like, you know, typing generics or async IO, you know, and th this sort of thing. And the other kind that I like because I just like those topics are those kind of meditative talks where nobody asks me to do things like FM synthesis in Python or MIDI sequencing or whatever, but I just, feel better knowing that I did this and you know I, I was just always curious to do this so this talk is this latter kind right like it's uh, it's gonna be a talk where this is not bringing bread to my table it's just something I was always curious about and I feel like you know a lot of joy just playing with um, so to be clear this is gonna be code that we are generating. We're not gonna be using large models pre-generated with uh, tens of uh, millions of dollars of equipment and so on and so on. So even though it's definitely fun to use them, and you know, I myself, I'm pretty curious about them, uh, this is not gonna be about it. But like, just to get it out of the way, here's a friend of mine, David. We could turn him into, you know, Thanos. Uh, you know, we could turn him into uh, God of War, or we could turn him into the vocalist of the Smashing Pumpkins, right? So like, you know, all of those things like are definitely possible today. You know, I just did this on my computer like, you know, like a few days back just to show you that this is possible, but no. What we're gonna be talking about today is something where we can actually see the code and it's very small. It is surprisingly small. It is in fact deceptively small, but the result kind of looks like it is doing something complex, like it is a little bit alive, right? And what that's called is emergence, right? So it's, you know, when you have properties or behaviors of an entity that its parts do not have on their own. And what better place to introduce this concept in Prague where Johannes Kepler started his scientific, you know, journey and discovered that, okay, we actually have planets, uh, you know, uh, traveling on orbits, and those orbits are not circular and they're not uh, ovals, they're in fact ellipses, right? So everybody knows this now, like it was not, you know, very obvious back then. So he discovered this, but what I discovered really recently is that, oh, really, Earth is not really an ellipsis. The system of Earth and its moon is an ellipsis over the, the sun, but the Earth itself, due to the moon existing, has little squiggles in its orbit. So I never knew about this. Obviously, those are you know vastly exaggerated, so you can see what I'm talking about. But uh, just just this was already like more complex than I actually anticipated. You know, you kind of learn at school. You know, this is the orbit. Those are the planets. This is Jupiter. So I never expected this. Um, and when I uh, search for books to read during COVID where, you know, there was nothing else to do. Um, I found this uh, great series by Liu Shishin uh, where the first book is called The Three-Body Problem where literally it's about, you know, what would happen if there were three objects of similar mass actually interacting uh, with one another gravitationally. And he poses, well, the, that the orbits then like are no longer very simple. They're indistinguishable from an, a totally chaotic system. So I was like, okay, Python, tell me how they look like. And Python is like, here's how they look like. And I'm like, okay, this is a little informative, but I still, you know, I still cannot figure out like how it would feel to be on one of those planets. So what I did is just to generate like, an animation that would show me like, you know, how they interact. And obviously, Pablo Galindo, my friend who is an actual physicist, was really quick to say like, 
this is not actually how this would go, you know, uh, in actual physics, but it's close enough for me to be able to just, you know, notice like, oh, those uh, interactions between those three objects are in fact pretty chaotic and uh, complex. So I did a bunch of this, uh, you know, back in, what was it, 2021, I guess. Um, I like this, and that's just matplotlib, so, you know, I could tell you about, like, all the derivatives there that I played with and whatnot, but you know, honestly, not that very interesting, uh, you know, for the context of this talk. Just saying, this is how I started actually playing with, uh, kind of, you know, this sort of topic. Um, pretty, pretty, um, in my case, oh, well, in my opinion at least. So yeah, let's leave the derivatives, let's leave the uh, theory here. Uh, let's just say, how did I make this animate? Well, it turns out that Matplotlib allows you to do this very easily, which I was very happy to discover. Uh, the only thing you have to do is create a func animation object for which you give a callback uh, that generates each frame, but it will even, you know, connect the frames together. You don't have to use any FFmpeg directly, you, you don't have to do anything uh, magical to get an MP4 file that you can play on the browser, uh, you can play on your Mac. So. I was very happy about this. Uh, yeah, and that's, that's essentially the kind of thing that we're gonna be talking about today. So, uh, there's gonna be a lot of code. I don't expect you to, you know, write the code down today. In fact, the code lives on GitHub. You can get the link later. I don't want you to look at it right now either because you're not gonna be looking at me and I like when you look at me. So, uh, let's just start with talking and then I'm gonna give you the link, okay? The fair deal. So, the kind of, most simple and maybe even like over-talked and over-researched system that has this emergent behavior is Conway's Game of Life. But I would still wanna kind of begin with it because it's very fun to even give it to beginners to implement because it's just so easy. Like there's literally just three rules uh, in which you know this little system operates and the end result is surprisingly uh, fun and complex. So the rules are essentially this, right? You have a grid, and, and those grids have cells, uh, and the cells can be either alive or not. And any live cell with two or three live neighbors survives to the next round. Any dead cell with three live neighbors becomes a live cell. All other live cells die in the next generation. Similarly, all dead cells stay dead. So, you know, you can just use those three rules and then just a few lines of Python and matplotlib again, you can just get a result like this. And when you animate this, you notice that, you know, okay, like I can sort of figure out what is going on, but certain behaviors are surprising. Certain parts of the image are too stable. It's like, why? And certain are extremely chaotic. And others even oscillate, right? Like you have those little, well, they animate so quickly that they look like pluses, right? But you can see they oscillate. So there's quite a bit of action going on here. So just to implement this, it's, you know, very, very, uh, you know, kind of straightforward. So I was able to do the entire thing in one day, not even knowing Matplotlib, like, you know, very well beforehand. So I was very happy that, you know, kind of this sort of thing can be achieved. So let's look at the implementation. So mm, I wouldn't need to use data classes, and I better didn't because now, like, Kinek is looking at me angrily. But, um, you know, uh, just for clarity, just to have some kind of model uh, that we're talking about, like there's gonna be an object that has uh, a representation of the grid, so rows and columns, and a bunch of other helper fields that we don't initialize, well, we don't actually mm, require for the user to initialize. We do it for the, for the user, right? So uh, matplotlib subplots are gonna give us the figure and the axes. The grid is just a NumPy array. Uh, MPT is NumPy typing. It's a package where you can use it so that MyPy understands what's going on, so that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, and the image is just a widget, I guess, on matplotlib so that we can actually show the grid from, um, uh, from NumPy directly on uh, the plot. And you know, the update uh, callback that we're gonna be using, just a sing single screen of code, of which like easily half is just calculating the neighbors. And you would say like, well, we can probably do it easier. And we, we can, but this one has a nice feature which is that it wraps around. So if you uh, kind of go to the edge of the, of the board, uh, you know, if you follow, you're gonna reach the other opposite edge, right? So it wraps around, it, it, it's kind of nice for animations and so on. So, you know, 
You can see even the rules of the game, literally in the if and elif there. So that's just four, four lines. There's just four lines because the third thing that, you know, what, what's dead stays dead is just guaranteed by us just copying the array at, uh, at, the, at the top. Right? And the main function is, again, we're just creating the game of life model and funk animation that we used previously allow us to just, you know, run it. Uh, in the slide before, uh, what we had was just randomly generating stuff for us. Uh, there's two, two slides below. Uh, yeah, so like NumPy random choice. But you know, we already seen how that looks like. So I'm gonna show you something that was actually pre-chosen by me to just show you some of the research uh, kind of emergent behaviors of Conway's Game of Life. So you can see that you know there are certain oscillators. The one on the top left has like this uh, period of three, so three different frames. But the one next to it has a period of 15. So there's 15 different forms of it, but it just actually loops forever. And then, then there's those three, what I would say they're birds, but the, or, you know, the researchers call them spaceships. So there's this uh, lightweight spaceship, middleweight spaceship, and the heavyweight spaceship. And the little thing that goes, you know, kind of uh, diagonally, that's the glider. Like, uh, probably the most famous thing that, you know, is animated in Conway's Game of Life. So you're saying, oh gosh, like, you know, I don't want to see Matlob live ever again. Like, this is boring. This is what my day job is about. Uh, so good news is like you don't even need Matplotlib, you don't even need like NumPy if you don't want to. Like you can do game of life in anything. Like you can literally just use the Turtle module. And in fact, like Turtle is so easy because it just pre comes like with Python. It runs in the browser as we learned, uh, you know, uh, in the day before, uh, like today before uh, um, doing one of those talks. So let's just see how that would look like, and it would look like very easily. Uh, you create some of the turtle things that you need, uh, you know, and when there is turtle, if you ever heard about it, like what it's doing is it has this uh, actor on, uh, in the, on the screen, and with the, those comments you can just draw things, animate it, right? So obviously we're not gonna be doing something a little more complex, but it's already pretty interesting that even kids can learn to code with Turtle because, you know, kind of very few commands allow you to have some graphical result on the screen, right? F for example, here we actually have a function, so we can learn about functions, and when you call it uh, a few times, you know, kind of you have a graphical effect, you know, with the rotation, it actually becomes pretty interesting. So the fun thing about this educationally is that it runs also in the browser, as I said, so uh, this is pythonsandbox.com by Ken Burris. It's unfortunately based on Sculpt, so this is Python 2. So it, it is fully functional, but you know you might discover quickly that if, if the kids try something more complex, they're gonna see that this is not the Python that the current dogs talk about and so on and so on. But the PyScript people are currently actually working on uh, making Turtle work directly with PyScript, so soon enough you're gonna be able to just use that, and PyScript is the future, so obviously very interesting. So okay, like you know, uh, triangles aside, like let's uh, go and implement our game of life. In fact, our model becomes easier than it was before because we no longer need those matplotlib uh, figures and axes. What we need is to essentially generate our uh, grid. I kept it as an NumPy array for simplicity, but it could be just a regular array uh, from Python or just lists of lists if you want to. And then we have some setup for the turtle uh, and functions. I made them, uh, you know, different functions so that we can see some, de de um, you know, destructuring, right? Like we draw the board by drawing cells, and that's the kind of simple um, double for loop, and so on and so on. So the little complicated thing with turtle is, you know, it always has the pen down, and it wants to animate everything nicely, so if you want to actually draw a lot of things, you have to kind of work against it to, to stop doing the animating thing. So we did a lot of that, uh, and then the updating the board is essentially, again, a double for loop that updates every cell. And here, I kind of caved to your, you know, judgmental looks, and I'm like, okay, I actually know we can count the neighbors using NumPy vector operations. So let's 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 do that here. It still, you know, takes a lot of uh, space because the font needs to be a little big so you can read it, uh, and you know, the other formatter really insists on this kind of formatting. Well, um, but yeah, but the if and elif that is the rules of the game, still the same. So finally, our main function is just a 
while loop right now. And with our predefined uh, grid, it would something like uh, look, look something like this, right? So we already know about the oscillators, we already know about the spaceship, but now we reach some differences in behavior because uh, the vector functions that uh, I use now, like for uh, counting the neighbors, do not wrap around, and so the behavior changes. So that is also something very interesting about playing with stuff like this because even small changes might actually result in some different behavior. Is it correct or was the uh, previous one correct? Who's to say? Like that's the fun thing about playing with graphics is like most of the time this is not your day job. So um, this is just kind of interesting discoveries about like, oh, um, you know, like little uh, edge cases and little uh, effects of what you're using affect the end result in fun ways. But you know, you're like, okay, uh, I want something more impressive. You know, this, this game of life, I've heard about it in Turtle, come on, dude. Uh, so let's go and look at strange attractors. So uh, systems that are also super easy to understand, uh, but look much more uh, kind of pleasing to the eye, right? So the, one of the most uh, kind of popular probably is the Clifford attractor that, mm, you know, you just define uh, X and Y points uh, of the next generation by sines and cosines uh, with the um, formulas right here. So there's four um, parameters, A, B, C, D, uh, which you can twi uh, tweak to get different results from this attractor, right? So doing the same in Turtle, we would have to configure not to walk around and do stuff very slowly. Uh, we literally just implement the Clifford attractor like this. So you can recognize the new X and new Y lines being directly uh, taken from the formulas, uh, the, ma the mathematical formulas. And yeah, and we're just drawing dots in the place where, uh, where the new X is. Um, so just making it work, is it gonna be super impressive? Uh, yeah, okay, could be better. Uh, it kind of looks like a, you know, uh, old, you know, um, badly developed picture. We can do better. Uh, so we can change our super trivial uh, Clifford attractor function to, for example, treat the points that were generated first as points that are in the back. So if they're in the back, they should be less bright. They should be darker. So we can just do that and just say, okay, so if we have a part which is just I uh, divided by our iterations, let's just set the pen color to this. And the pen color here, you know, just uses the RGB part. We're using the same one, so it's gonna be uh, grayscale. And just with that, it already looks a little nicer. So at this point, you're asking, okay, Turtle works when, with um, PyScript now, so can we do this with PyScript? I tried, and I could generate 10,000 points. If I tried more, well, the tab crashed, so like probably there's some efficiency things that you know, the PyScript people have to still uh, kind of you know, work on. Um, but yeah, it is possible, but not to the extent where it is actually very graphically pleasing. So let's just go back and just do a bit more like in regular TK inter turtle. So if we uh, look at our previous picture, we think, you know, okay, and if we can maybe make it a little more colorful, and also if something is in the back, maybe it should have this kind of, you know, out of focus effect. So it should be more kind of, you know, larger, and the things in the front should be smaller. But how can we make the things in, smaller than a dot in Turtle? And that was a little bit of a head scratcher for me because the, the implementation of a, even a dot makes it kind of a big circle. So what you can do is you can just say that uh, Turtle should you know, uh, pen down and go forward zero steps and then it just actually puts a single pixel where it stands. Uh, so having this, this already looks like some you know, kind of art from, a, you know, from an old book or so, or so. Like there's not enough points for this to be interesting, but we can do this kind of now, this uh, kind of out of focus effect, right? So how do we achieve this? We just say the pen size should be different depending on how far we went. And with this and the colorful changes, so you know, kind of, before we just went linearly, but if we multiply, we're gonna get a more kind of, uh, you know, um, slowly growing um, function, right? Like so with the RGB, we're gonna grow like R quadratically, 
and G, uh, you know, cubely, I don't know how to say it in English. Uh, yeah, so it it'll should look more or less kind of violety, and it does. Uh, and that is already like quite interesting uh, because you know we're getting kind of effects that are. Uh, I would never think before that, you know, actually turtle can be used for something that doesn't look like, you know, just those three triangles that kids are, are learning. Like you can do quite a bit with that, and uh, that generates pretty quickly. Uh, so yeah, like obviously this would not be that interesting if it were be only images, so we can just say that if I divide it, well, like the uh, mod 500 is uh, zero, then let's update the turtle so we can actually achieve um, animation or that where, you know, the Clifford attractor appears out of nowhere. And I find that pleasing. It kind of looks like, you know, I could put it on a, a screensaver. Um, obviously, those don't really have that many points because turtle, uh, when people research the Clifford attractor well, and other attractors, what they usually do is they generate millions of points, not thousands, right? So I have like 50,000 points there or 100,000. This would be 50 million. So maybe it doesn't look very impressive to you right now, but like if you zoom in, uh, th those have so many details in them, and yet they kind of look, you know, uh, like organic, like they, there will be some intention behind them. Uh, so yeah, very cool. And they also look sort of like they're 3D, even if they're done, because, you know, it's just X and Y that we're calculating. So it got me thinking, like, what if I could do something 3D in Python? And obviously I was thinking about PyScript the entire time because, you know, uh, the browser is a very nice uh, deployment target. It's very easy to just show people what you did when they don't have to install anything. So this is what I did. And in fact, that actually works pretty well. And I was very happy to, you know, kind of work out the kinks uh, just at the WebAssembly Summit earlier in the, uh, in the week. So actually I can confidently say that this is this is working now uh, very well. So yeah, like PyScript, you just make it work by uh, adding a script uh, tag in your uh, HTML file and a style sheet. Um, and yeah, there are so those two like blue lines that hide a bit of details there. Um, but there's a PyConfig file and a PyScript code that you're actually writing. So this is pretty easy. If you're really wondering about those blue lines, like the first one is an ES6 import map where we can specify some JavaScript dependencies that we have. And the other one is something that should not exist but currently does because PyScript does not handle those ES6 import maps very well yet. So okay, we need to have this. But then you can actually use your PyConfig to, for example, install packages like NumPy or whatnot. Um, in fact, like um, there was a talk earlier in the day about how those packages do install in your browser when you're using PyScript, so that's pretty interesting. And you can have dependencies of your own, like your own files. You can have more of those files in your project, so you don't have to put everything in a single minified Python file. So yeah, so uh, let's say like on the left, there's, we're gonna have to actually have this main file, and on the right, I'm gonna be showing you portions of the lib3, uh, where we're actually gonna be drawing things. So to draw things, uh, we're thinking in 3D, and WebGL is essentially OpenGL 3.0 ES, so like this simplified edition that is available on small devices, um, including in your car probably, honestly. Um, it's not very well used there, but it is uh, there in the microcontroller. Um, yeah, so it's, it's great, but it's also very low level and annoying to use. So there's a very popular library for JavaScript called 3.js, and with PyScript, we can just use that. So I wrote lib3, like, as just, you know, to just encapsulate what is happening so I can explain it much easier that there's a scene. So the scene is this th three-dimensional place that holds some objects that we're gonna draw. There's a camera, so, you know, a, a very special object that just looks at the scene, right? So it is directed towards uh, some objects, you know, it has also, like, a physical position there. There is a renderer, so a canvas on HTML that is gonna actually show us what the camera is seeing. And there's controls so you can, uh, in, you know, affect what you are doing with, say, a trackpad, a mouse, or, you know, uh, a controller, whatever. And then there's the lights. There has to be some lights in the scene, otherwise everything is black and you cannot see anything. Um, and I just added stats so we can see how many FPS we can get, actually, you know, when Python is generating 3D stuff. So yeah, on the library side, we need to import things from JS, which imports them from the global this. Uh, and the uppercase three is our 3JS library that we're gonna be using. 
Um, so yeah, like a lot of the things look a little bit weird, just a little bit weird because you, you for example, have to create new objects by using dot new on those objects because there is a new keyword in JavaScript and you have to remember the things that we just imported magically. It's an FFI, you know, like technology. We're essentially interacting with JavaScript code in a seamless way. So I can take this dot new, you know, kind of uh, ugliness any day for this ability to be able to interact with 3JS from Python. Uh, so yeah, we get the scene, we create a camera with some um, parameters so that you know it kind of looks naturally. Uh, we create the renderer, or that is a WebGL renderer, set its size, and we append it to the document body. So we actually have this element, we're gonna be able to see it. Lights, I thought, you know, it's gonna be fun if there's more than one. So we have a green light that is reaching very far, but it's kind of dim, and there's a white light that is not reaching that far, so it's only gonna light the objects that are very close to us, sort of like a flash of, of, of a cell phone. Uh, and the controls, yeah, like it would be way, coo way less cool if it wasn't interactive, so I added some controls. The stats are very easy to use because it's a kind of like a, enclosed libraries, so you just, in, you know, you just have to start them and stop them on your frames, but, you know, other than that, it's gonna display by itself uh, if you appended it to the document, which we did. And then, yeah, we have to generate some cubes. So the fun thing here is that we are generating them with the Python random module, and that works, uh, and we are interacting with the uh, JavaScript world, like, and we even generate them using a uh, generator, it's a Python generator, and it's even, you know, kind of unlimited, right? So it would generate as many cubes as you want unless you stop it. So in the init uh, function that I wrote, I actually stop it after 50,000 cubes. So like this is how many we reach. And here we have this animate callback. So yeah, it mm, gathers stats. So you can see the stats begin and stats end. But the only thing that will do is it'll move the camera around using sines and cosines because that really looks kind of naturally. Uh, but also it moves the lights with us. So it's, it's as if we were you know, shedding the light on the object so it looks more naturally. Other, uh, otherwise it would be looking like the lights are from some invisible lamp and we're just, you know, kind of, it, it will look way less natural. So now lights are following the camera. Yeah, and the only magical thing there is that we are uh, scheduling the next callback ourselves by just telling the JavaScript engine in the browser, request animation frame is gonna be this callback. And this callback has to be a proxy from Python to JavaScript only because re reference counting in Python would destroy too many things for us if we did not hold on uh, to this memory like this. So yeah, we can um, actually fire this up, and when we do, okay, we actually see this effect where, you know, it's barely what, like tw 20 FPS, but to me that is pretty cool that, you know, there was like a few lines of Python that we wrote, and it's running in a browser, we can actually move it, right, so we can actually use our mouse to uh, affect where we're going. Um, so yeah, like this starts being really interesting to me. Like, you know, like this is something that I'm definitely gonna be working on more in the future. Since, you know, um, this is just randomly placed cubes and it already looks um, pretty engrossing. Uh, and it would be even more interesting if those cubes actually, you know, did something interesting. So yeah, okay, uh, WebGL, we can do it in Python. We can also approximate images with triangles. So uh, another thing that is, Super interesting to me is like, how is it that you know you can have a picture, like an input picture, and then make the computer recreate that picture in a cubist you know combination of some primitives like triangles or rectangles or so on and so on. Like, how does that actually work? So I saw work by Michael Fogelman who did like a bot for Twitter where he uh, you know kind of had um, Creative Commons images from. Um, from Flickr, I think, of uh, being, you know, kind of changed into this cubist thing. And I was like, oh, this looks awesome. Like, can I do this in Python? So I took this picture, 
And I wanted to essentially create something like this, right? So, you know, that is actually a picture from uh, my trip last year to uh, Spain. So it's topical because we, we've seen the Pablo Picasso Museum, and, you know, so, you know, kind of cubist. Uh, but my first attempts were a little different. Like, you know, I couldn't quite figure it out very quickly, uh, but I tried very hard. So at some point I actually got like, oh, how do you get there? So uh, first of all, like, you know, kind of some epiphanies I had, like, were like, for example, that, well, when you start optimizing, Optimizing, so essentially what you're doing is you're putting one triangle at a time, right? And you want to put the most correct triangle and then the most, uh, you know, another most correct triangle and so on and so on. So how do you decide that they are the most correct triangle? Well, you can use like, you know, a, a square mean uh, error and this is, this is what I used for this, but you have to start somewhere. So for example, making the canvas use the average color of the resulting image is already kind of putting you somewhere where it actually already looks sort of non-terrible. And one weird discovery was that you can um, count the average color of an image by just rescaling it to one pixel and then the pixel is the average color. So it's, uh, yeah, that, I don't know, like for me it was a little funny. Um, so yeah, like what we're doing here is uh, we have essentially a loop where we're generating as many triangles as we have to. Uh, those triangles are generated by just choosing the next triangle. Um, and yeah, and then we save the result. So how do we choose the next triangle? Uh, well, we have to generate a candidate triangle and that's literally just, you know, just generate any triangle. You know, any triangle is fine. Uh, we assign it the color from, you know, the place uh, on the input image where we, uh, that, that we would put the triangle on. Um, and then what? Uh, we calculate whether the square mean error is a little, a little better than it was without the triangle. And so on and so on. And if there is an improvement, we're just, you know, repeating the process over and over again. Uh, so how do you um, calculate the difference? Square mean error in, um, in NumPy is very easy. In fact, you could even use le fewer lines, but if you would actually do the square mean, you would use the dot mean, right? And I use dot sum because I like integers better. They are a little faster, and that actually allows me to debug easier. Like, I don't, I don't need the mean. Uh, I'm not gonna be comparing different images of different sizes and so on. Like, I'm always comparing like the previous state of the same image with the next one, so having the sum is perfectly fine for this uh, purpose, and it lets me, with inter uh, lets me with integers. So that's pretty good. Um, the candidate triangle, random stuff. Uh, the candidate color, here is only just, you know, taking this actual rectangle of the place where the, uh, where the triangle would be. And that was already not too bad, uh, but it was also not too great. The colors were a little kind of mushy, you know, they're like not, not so bright as they should be. So I actually had to bite the bullet and count only the average colors under the triangle. And that was a little painful for my high school math and, you know, kind of, uh, not knowing how NumPy works, so it took me a while to figure it out. Uh, and also later on I figured out that, you know, actually just converting on pill images, uh, so pillow images to NumPy arrays is not a free operation, so if you do it a lot, it's just slow. Um, but the result was already better, right? And we could improve on this later on uh, with, you know, generating the candidate triangles in a little more uh, smart way, right? So, for example, you, you generate a random triangle, but after some point when you already found one that is improving your score, we can just try to mutate it. So we can just try to just move it a little, so like just, you know, kind of single uh, point uh, a little right or left so that we are actually improving on our score on something that we already know uh, that is not bad. And this kind of approach is called hill climbing, where you already have some result that is not terrible and you're improving on it. So having this, we already started achieving something that resembles human beings. It's still like very far off, but you know, kind of, um, it already made me hopeful that I can actually do something with this. So I made many further optimizations, obviously, because, uh, you know, kind of this sort of rabbit hole does not see any, any end. Um, but in the end, I managed to actually make this monstrosity of an async I/O multi-process thing that you know kind of actually reports the progress of the worker processes as well, which I'm pretty proud of. Uh, Rich, by the way, amazing. I I I, I love this framework. Um, so yeah, like you know, kind of I did a bunch of things where I tried and abandoned things, uh, but in the end, it worked out. 
Is it easy to debug if you have multiprocessing? It is not. So if you are on Linux, for example, because uh, it doesn't work on Mac OS, I'm sorry, and you're wondering why this task three is going slower than all the other ones, you can use a Bloomberg library or tool called PyStack to actually look into a running process and see like what is it doing right now. Like it is super useful, I wish it worked on Mac OS because on Linux it works very well. So for example, looking at this master process, you would see that, oh, there is a process, it's Python, it has the gill and the entire nice stack trace, but it's the current stack trace of what is happening at the moment. So you can see that actually I wasn't lying about the async IO, I wasn't lying about the multiprocessing. There is some shenanigans happening there, but looking at our slow uh, worker um, process, you could see, for example, that it doesn't say it holds the gill. But, but why not? That is, that is a little weird. Uh, so if you scroll down, because the traceback is really long, you will discover that, okay, it's in NumPy, and NumPy is famously freeing the gill if it's doing numeric operations so that you can do something else uh, with threads uh, with Python. So yeah, you can also notice that there's a root uh, there because uh, you know, kind of looking into other processes requires uh, administrative privileges. But yeah, I highly recommend you looking at um, PyStack if you wanna debug applications that are already running. Like this is, you know, a stupid toy that I'm writing, but if you are in production and you have production servers and they're misbehaving, PyStack sounds like an awesome tool for this, like where you can actually see what is going on. So yeah, like, you know, kind of long story short, I managed to evolve this a little so that, you know, if you squint or if you're really in the back, like it kind of looks like the original image, you know? And maybe if you're like, okay, I only know this is the original image because I saw it first, uh, then maybe you can tell me like, you know, like, does this look like anything to you? And obviously I'm animating because we can animate now. So that's also cool. Uh, we're gonna wait for those 500 triangles to generate. Uh, they, they generate like, it takes like eight minutes for them to generate uh, in Python. It should be faster, but this, this was uh, the fastest I could get. So yeah, if you don't know what that is, it is, uh, a piece of cake, which implementing it wasn't. Uh, but you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. So yeah, this, is a, this has been a random talk, right? But in, even in this random talk, like what we learned about was there, that there are systems that are emergent, so they have like literally just two lines of the actual logic, the core logic, and they generate things that have a lot of complexity in them. Uh, Game of Life is the obvious example that you now know all about because you know about the middleweight spaceship. Um, but we also talked about the Clifford Attractor, we talked about WebGL, which I made work in PyScript, which I'm super, about, uh, super happy about. And then we looked at uh, triangles, right? Like, you know, so how we can approximate images to triangles. And now, the most interesting thing is that this rabbit hole has no bottom, right? You can just imagine that there are things that you could do with this knowledge to just connect the, you know, disjointed elements of this talk into something that makes more consistent sense. For example, we generate points for the Clifford Attractor, and some we already kind of treat as if they are in the back, right? Because we are dimming them here in the turtle image. But what if we just generated those points in WebGL instead of just doing random boxes that are just randomly placed? We could then travel through the Clifford Attractor, which would maybe be more interesting, right? And even the triangles, if you think about this, any triangle in 3D can be represented as this uh, equilateral triangle that is just, you know, kind of uh, skewed somehow, right? It's placed in 3D, so it doesn't look from your perspective as uh, if it's equilateral, but it is. So we could make this image in 3D such that we can travel through it and it doesn't look like anything to you, but then we pan out, we zoom out, and suddenly it's our logo or something, right? Like, which I think, you know, kind of it's uh, something that is intriguing to um, pursue, right? So yeah, the code does live on GitHub, in fact, like, you know, it's, uh, those are very short programs, like, you know, I uh, claim no responsibility over them, uh, but what I'm essentially saying is like, if you ever, ever feel overwhelmed by your day job, which is entirely, you know, kind of serious, you can always just go and just try to play with something that has immediate visible results, and graphics is that, like, I have, 
avoided it for a long time because I somehow never, you know, kind of um, thought about this line of work as something that, you know, uh, I could do. But it turns out, like, no, okay, maybe I don't want to work on Witcher 4. Uh, but, you know, for just to generate a bunch of images that look nice, this is very easy with Python. So yeah, I got inspired by a bunch of people. Roland Stoll has an excellent article on the Earth orbit wiggles. Um, there's some work on the three body problem gravitational systems that was more uh, kind of physically correct than what I did. Um, the Clifford Attractor article by BL Badger has excellent examples of different sorts of uh, ABCD parameters that you can put there. And obviously all of this kind of started by Michael Fogelman uh, and his uh, primitive bot on Twitter. So yeah, my name is Lukas Langa, and this has been uh, Games of Life. Thank you for coming. So we do have five minutes for questions. Yeah, okay. Let's go. Cool. If people want to. Hi, thank you for the talk. I noticed in your code that you use in many places a while loop with a counter instead of a for loop with range or something like that. Is there a reason for it? Is it faster? Oh, uh, so maybe it is. Uh, like the, the reason for most weirdness probably in the code is that it just evolved. So like there, there had been like previous versions that had to be a while loop, but then they stopped having to be a while loop because they're more regular right now in the end. Uh, but having a while loop just usually just lets you be a little more, you know, kind of flexible in how you want to exit the loop or progress it. For example, uh, in the uh, generating of the um, triangles, I think, I uh, ended up in, with code where I don't think I have it on a slide, uh, where it's, um, it doesn't always count the next iteration if the triangle that you're getting is invalid for whatever reason. For example, we've already tried whether this one is better or the triangle where we allow for it to be a little bit out of bounds because otherwise you will never cover bounds like in your image. So we allow it to be a little bit out of bounds. But what if it's entirely out of bounds? The entire triangle is not on the screen, then you can't really do anything with that. So we reject those triangles without advancing the loop, right? So this is very easy with a while, a while loop because you can just continue without uh, you know, incrementing the counter. Uh, with a for loop, that would be a little more complicated to achieve. I would have to have a loop in, inside the loop to, to you know, cover for those special cases. Yeah, thank you. All right. Okay, looks like no more questions. Thank cool. you very much. Sure. Fresh.